Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Professor Avinash Nadich. I am the Dean of Institute of Legal Studies and Research, GLA University, Mathura. So, dear students, today we will talk about a very important topic when we talk about law, regulations, our rights, constitutional rights, fundamental rights, legal rights, then ultimately everything goes to the judiciary because it is only judiciary who can determine who is right and who is wrong, okay? whether it is a civil or criminal or corporate ultimately matter goes to the judiciary. So, it is good to understand that how judiciary system works in India, what is judiciary in India, how many layers of judiciary in India, what are their powers, what they can do, because if you understand their powers then you can go to them to uh, enforce your legal and constitutional rights. So, today we will talk about Indian judicial system. <clears throat> so, Indian judicial system like you can see from this slide that there is a the top level is the Supreme Court of India, then higher highest court in India and final court of appeal and it is in Delhi. Okay. So, this is the final court everything stops here. Okay. There is nothing above Supreme Court of India in India in terms of judiciary. Okay, this is the final court and then below the Supreme Court there are various high courts almost in all states uh, they have high courts and the high court is the highest court of that particular state. Okay, so, if, I, if you talk about suppose like the uh, Maharashtra then Bombay, uh, Bombay high court or in Delhi then Delhi high court or you like in a West Bengal Kolkata high court. So, those high courts are also empowered by the constitutions to enforce legal and constitutional rights within that state. Okay. So, they do not do anything which is beyond the state, normally they focus only on that particular state and those high courts are the appellate uh, authority where people can go from the district court to the high court. Then a district and sub district courts like the civil courts, criminal courts, session courts So at the district level there is a district and session judge. He is the topmost judicial officer and below him there are different levels of uh, magistrates like the ADJ additional district judge, then CMM chief, uh, chief metropolitan magistrate or CJM and then civil judge metropolitan magistrate depending on the situation. So, you will see that at the district level uh, there are uh, like more than 30 to 40 judicial officers are taking care of all types of legal rights. Then we have a specialized court also in India like for example, at the district level you will find commercial courts where they do only commercial matters or the family courts uh, where they are dealing with only family disputes or maybe NI court because you know the, uh, the negotiable instrument act the check bouncing cases. So, uh, you will find a special court for uh, NI or CBI court enforcement directorate courts. So, you will find that there are a, even the labor courts are also there. So, at the district level you will find that there are two types of judges one that they are doing general civil and criminal you know they are dealing with almost everything. Then other side you will find specialized court and they are dealing with only specific issues I have mentioned few. So, there are more and more uh, the government of India and the high court and supreme courts they are creating specialized court. Because if there is a special matter then it is better to give all those matters in that particular district to a particular officer or a judicial judge. So, that matter can solve easily and quickly. Then apart from the court system, apart from the court system we have alternate dispute uh, resolution me mechanism also. The concept is that uh, it is not necessary that whenever there is a dispute between two people for civil, criminal or corporate, uh, then they should go and fight in the courtroom. 
they can settle their issues outside of court also. See, that was the historical understanding of Indian society that people used to sit together, they used to talk, discuss and finally, uh, with the help of the elder people in the society and in family, they used to solve their disputes. So, the same idea is also working in India. So, like one is Lok Adalat. Lok Adalat is courts of the people. So, it is a constituted by the state district, sub district legal service committees and settle cases they are pre litigation or pending in court system. So, the Lok Adalat is conducted by the court only normally it happens on the Sundays and by the district legal service authority and uh, they organize these Lok Adalats where the people uh, they come if they have any litigation if they are planning to go for any litigation or any case is pending in the court and then they also invite lot of uh, civil servants like the electricity department, consumer department, there are so many like even the police department. So, they invite all the departments and the people and individuals also if they have any dispute with each other, then they try to solve those issues uh, in outside of the court settlement. Okay. So, Lok Adalat is a very effective manner where people are solving their PT offenses, PT issues, you know, obviously Lok Adalats are not dealing with very heavy um, issues, but if there is suppose a dispute of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, so instead of going to the court and investing lot of money, time and uh, resources, why do not you go and, you know, uh, settle through the Lok Adalat. Then we have tribunals also, so tribunals are not like district court, high court, supreme court, they are more specialized as uh, judicial forum where we are uh, dealing with very special matters like the administrative tribunals, okay, other tribunals like national green tribunal. So, you will find more than 50 to 60 tribunals in our country uh, where people are solving specialized issues like the administrative tribunal for example, if any government officer state or central if they have any dispute with the government, okay, with the government then instead of going to the civil court or uh, criminal court or high court they first they have to go to the administrative tribunal and the national green tribunal for example, so national green tribunal deals with the environmental issues. Okay. So, you are army tribunal you will find where if any serving army officer or any retired army officer if they have some uh, dispute with the army air force and navy then instead of going to the uh, normal courts they can go to army tribunal. So, you will find multiple tribunals as I said more than 50 tribunals then different commissions also like national consumer commission, national uh, uh, national child commission, national uh, woman commission. So, all these agencies are also acting as a court and appeals from decision may lie to the court. So, if you are not happy with these tribunals okay, then you can appeal in the high court and supreme court. Then in recent time we have creating a system that is called Gram Nyayale, Gram Nyayale means village courts. Okay. So, grassroots courts in rural areas set up by the states in consultation with the high courts, adjudicate civil and criminal matters and can be mobile courts also. This is a very new concept which we are trying to develop in India that can we bring justice at door, you know can we, can we bring judicial system in small villages. Students you know that in our country uh, the district headquarter is very big, sometime people are living in a small village and their nearest district uh, headquarter or the nearest court uh, might be maybe it, uh, 40, 50, 80, 100 kilometer away. Okay. In that scenario uh, the poor uh, villagers they are going to those courts for their small litigations, PT uh, disputes with each other, maybe small land dispute small family dispute, there are so many small disputes are happening in villages and if we do not have strong Gram Nyayale or the village court system, then they are investing lot of time, money and obviously, it is also uh, affecting the social harmony in the villages. Okay. So, considering that factor, the government is also trying to create more and more village courts. And then if you are not happy with the village court, then obviously it is a court, you know, it is not like the tribunals, it is a pure court and uh, they are also judicial officers and if you are not happy, then you can appeal before the additional district judge or a, a additional session judge. So, let us try to understand that how we developed our Indian judicial system from the uh, freedom. 
Though Indian legal system stretches back centuries, its modern judicial system is shaped by the constitution of India, which was promulgated after India became independent from British rule in 1947. So, court system, judicial system is not new in India. We used to have very robust, very efficient judicial system. However, during the British colonial period, the, our ancient and our uh, traditional system of judiciary got destroyed. Okay. Then the Britishers introduced their British way of judicial system where you know the independent courts are working, not the people are deciding, not the families or the community. So, justice system uh, moved from uh, community to a specialized, a professional judicial officer or the uh, government servant. Okay. So, the Indian Constitution Assembly debated and drafted the Constitution which was adopted as you know 26 November 1949 and came into effect on 26 January 1950. The Constitution established Republic of India, a union of states with a federal system known as the Union or Central Government and State Governments and Union Territories. So, this federal or quasi federal system of India which we have adopted where there will be a strong central government and the states you know the various states they will have their autonomy. So, we had to create a system where the central and states they are working in a very uh, harmonious manner you know we, we never wanted so many disputes between central and states. So, we had to create a judicial system where things can work very smoothly. Let us start with the Supreme Court okay, because th this is the important thing. So, Indian court uh, hierarchy, the constitution established the Supreme Court whose head is the Chief Justice of India. So, first you need to understand that High Court and Supreme Court they are the constitutional courts you know they are established by the constitution of India. So, they are very much protected by the constitution, the government or the state cannot uh, change them very much you know. So, see they have their own autonomy. As I discussed in my previous lectures that in our country or in any democratic country we want to have separation of power. So, the separation of power concept that the uh, judiciary, executives and legislatures they should be separate you know they should not be common and one should not affect the others functioning you know they should have distances at the same time they are all working with each other to take the country to the next level for the economic and social growth. So, Indian court is very very uh, autonomous very much protected by the Supreme uh, by the constitution. The Supreme Court generally sits in New Delhi, but the chief justice can specify other locations with the approval of the president of India there is a provision in the Supreme Court. However, it has not been exercised so far and uh, there is a provision that Supreme Court if they want the government wants and Supreme Court wants then uh, they can open their branches outside of Delhi also. So, this is a like a new idea which is emerging right now that can we have more branches or can we have more benches of the uh, Supreme Court in various uh, um, you know cities like the south it can be Chennai or Bangalore or in uh, you know east it can be Kolkata then Bombay. So, you know uh, people from different parts of India they do not need to go to the Delhi just to attend the Supreme Court hearings uh, because if you are not happy with the high court order then the only option for you is to go to the Delhi and file a case before the Supreme Court. Okay. Supreme Court proceedings are conducted in, in English and it was very, very much strategic decision. Why? Because as you understand that our Indian constitution recognizes around 18 languages. Okay. So, when I say 18 languages means that all high courts they might have their own regional languages. Okay. They may adopt English or judicial officers or the high court judges or the advocates can say that we will, we will work in our local language. Like for example, if you go to Tamil Nadu they like to use their own language you know if you go to Assam they like to use their own language. So, when uh, we are talking about a federal system then obviously, we needed one common language which can connect everyone because if a judge is coming from uh, suppose Assam and he becomes a Supreme Court judge maybe he is very good in Assamese, but uh, maybe not in other languages. So, if a matter is coming from uh, suppose Karnataka in Kannada then maybe he, he obviously, he will not understand anything. So, in that scenario. 
uh, we decided that the language of the Supreme Court would be English only and same thing applies to advocates also. Lot of advocates are going to Supreme Court to represent their clients from various states. So, obviously, they speak different languages. So, when they are arguing in the Supreme Court, so for the benefit of the opposite counsel as well as for the court, uh, they should speak a common language. So, that is why we have an English language. Uh, otherwise, you know, like we could have adopted regional languages also, but for the operational point of view, that could be a serious issue. Supreme Court is a court of record with the power to punish for contempt of itself. So, power of uh, contempt is that if someone is not complying with the Supreme Court orders or directions, Supreme Court send that person to the jail also. Okay. So, the contempt of the court is a power where if a court believes that someone has insulted the court, not the judicial officer, but the uh, court itself and uh, if there are non-compliance by the parties, then they can send them to the uh, jail under the contempt of court act. Supreme Court judgments are binding on all courts and must be delivered in open court with the concurrence of a majority of judges who heard the case. So, first you need to understand that in India, we follow the common law system where the judgments of Supreme Court are automatically binding on all courts, you know, so uh, district court, high court. Um, if you give any Supreme Court judgment, they cannot say no. Okay. But if you give a high court order, like a, suppose you are giving a Delhi high court order, the Delhi high court says that okay, this is legal or this is illegal, whatever. So, you cannot take that order and you can uh, go to suppose like Maharashtra and say okay, this is the Delhi high court order and this is my case and so it should be accepted. The Maharashtra high court or the Bombay high court is not under any legal obligation to accept that judgment. But if you bring any Supreme Court judgment before any high court or any district court, then it, it is legally binding on them and they cannot say no. And uh, at the Supreme Court generally sits in a minimum required two judges bank bench to be cop uh, with its workload, small benches determine a wide range of matters and their extensive number has to lead to inconsistent jurisprudence and uncertain precedent. So, sometime within the Supreme Court, you say that so many judges like 32 judges are dealing with so many issues. So, sometimes they give the judgments which is inconsistent and contradictory with each other, but that is the beauty of judiciary. This is how the jurisprudence and the new judgments are taking shape in our country. Now, let us try to understand jurisprudence, jurisdiction sorry. So, jurisdiction is a legal concept where the first thing the court will ask you that whether do I have jurisdiction in this matter or not. So, suppose if you have a dispute uh, for example, like uh, like you know 5 crore rupees okay, and you go to a civil judge at the district level, he cannot hear that matter because that jurisdiction does not lie with him. You know he can hear the matter up to 5 lakh. So, and suppose if there is a crime happening in one place like in city like in Bombay and you want to go and file a case against that person in the Chennai. Okay. So, that judicial officer cannot hear that matter because that he does not have that jurisdiction. So, jurisdiction is very, very important to understand in law that which court has the jurisdiction to hear this matter. So, Supreme Court has extensive jurisdiction and powers specified in multiple sources including the constitution, statutes and case laws. So, they have the original power, the original jurisdiction, including jurisdiction to enforce constitutional rights known as writ jurisdiction. See, you need to understand that uh, as I told you that earlier, our constitution gives us fundamental rights like the fundamental to equality, fundamental to life of a uh, life of protection, right to life, freedom of speech, uh, religious rights. So, they are all fundamental rights under the Indian constitution. So, the constitution has made Supreme Court of India as a guardian, as a protector of the Indian constitution. Okay. So, if the government or any bureaucrat or anyone you know he is violating your fundamental rights, you can approach to high court and Supreme Court. High court will hear the matter under article 226 of the Indian constitution and the Supreme Court can hear the matter under article 32 
and not necessary that first you go to high court you can directly approach to supreme court also so this is very important the uh, writ jurisdiction protecting the people's fundamental constitutional rights okay and uh, that is protected by the supreme court then appellate jurisdiction so uh, if any appeal goes from delhi high court to anyone then that will be the supreme court so any high courts appeal lies to the supreme court tribunals like the national green tribunal then it will go to the high uh, supreme court so all tribunals appellate tribunals their appeals will go to the supreme court that's a appellate jurisdiction and that's a final point to decide the law point advisory jurisdiction so they do lot of advisory thing also so sometimes the government ask them that what 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 is the legal situation how the government should work on this particular matter so supreme court does advisory jurisdiction also for the uh, judicial uh, for the government transfer jurisdiction transfer jurisdiction when suppose like if there is a matter in one state and you believe that you will not get justice in that one particular state you can go and appeal in the supreme court that please transfer my matter from this state to that state okay so these type of things can also be done by the supreme court and parliament can extend supreme court jurisdictions and power in certain areas and circumstances so government of india the parliament has power to give more powers to supreme court but they cannot reduce its power so what is original jurisdiction first try to understand supreme court has original jurisdiction in disputes between the government of india and one or more states so sometimes there is a possibility that the government of india and member states like some maybe like maharashtra or kerala or bihar they have disputes with the government of india it ha it happens on so many issues like the revenue sharing land there are so many issues there are you know uh, even the disputes between the central government uh, department and state government department so in that scenario the, the supreme court is the place where this matter will be listed government of india and any states or on one side and one or more states on the other side so there is a possibility that maybe two uh, member states are fighting with the government of india so that matter will go to the supreme court two or more two or more states so there is a possibility that two member states are fighting with each other like for example there is a dispute between kerala and tamil nadu on some particular issues maybe the land issues boundaries issues revenue sharing issues or some river issues so in that scenario the supreme court is the place where they can go and solve their dispute dispute must evolve a question of law or fact on which the existence or extent of a legal right depends so they, they cannot go to supreme court just like that there has to be serious question of law question of law means interpretation of law is required so suppose the party a is saying that as per the interpretation of this law i am right the other party is saying that no no your interpretation is wrong my as per my interpretation i am right so then who will decide that what is the right interpretation of the this particular law so the supreme court will take action supreme court has jurisdictions in disputes over the election of president or vice president so suppose if there is a, a dispute or any controversy over the election of the president or vice president that matter will go to the supreme court supreme court does not have jurisdiction in disputes arising out of treaty agreement covenant engagements senate or similar instruments executed before the constitution commenced or which either countries to operate or provide that supreme court has no jurisdiction over such thing so if the government of india is making any international treaty you know if they are participating in any international convention like the wto or uh, united nations so if there is any dispute then that matter will not go to the supreme court that matter will go to the international courts okay then there is a dispute between two member uh, two countries like the india or maybe other country india and wto so that matter cannot be heard by the supreme court the writ jurisdiction people can move to supreme court to enforce their constitutional rights such as the right to equality before the law the supreme court can issue directions and orders to writ including habeas corpus mandamus prohibition curo warranto and certiorari to enforce them the right of people to move the supreme court to enforce their fundamental right cannot be suspended except as a constitutionally permitted so 
uh, during the emergency the question uh, in 1975 the question arises that whether the government through the law can suspend the constitutional fundamental rights of the people and the supreme court said no you cannot do it those rights are absolutely permanent and nobody can uh, suspend them nobody can delete them you can make necessary changes as per the law but you cannot suspend them completely Parliament can empower the Supreme Court to issue directions, orders or writs for the purpose other than the enforcement of fundamental rights. Though writ jurisdiction is a form of original jurisdiction, it is often catalyzed separately due to its significance in public life and emergence of public interest litigation. So, writ jurisdiction is very important for the Supreme Court because this is the place where people can go and fight against the government and state. So, suppose if the government makes a law and people believe that this law is not good for their fundamental rights, then they can go and challenge it before the Supreme Court. Appellate tribunal, uh, appellate jurisdiction, the Supreme Court had jurisdiction to hear appeals involving a question of constitutional interpretation. If there is an issue that there is a provision in constitution and the, uh, the government or the parties they want to uh, get the interpretation that what does it mean because see the law the beauty of law that uh, four people can give four different interpretation on the same law ok. So, that is why uh, because they like to interpret that law is as per their understanding or in their favor ok. So, ultimately we need some court system where people can go and ask them that please tell us what is the real interpretation of this particular provision and Supreme Court does it for the constitution also. Then civil appeals, criminal appeals, appeals by special leave, some cases can be appealed to the supreme court as of right while other requires high court certification. So, it is not like that every judgment from the high court can be appealed in the supreme court. So, most of the time uh, people go to the supreme court with high court certification that high court gives an order. However, High court makes a provision that this uh, case requires further interpretation. There are some legal issues which are still uh, need to be interpreted by the Supreme Court. So, they give a certification to the parties and those appeals can be admitted by the Supreme Court directly. However, if you say appeals by special leave, SLP, special leave petition. So, in that scenario, the party can approach to uh, Supreme Court without having high court certification. But that is again not a right of the parties that the Supreme Court will admit that issue. Supreme Court will hear the appeal uh, by special leave, but in 95 to 98 percent cases they reject special leave petition. If they believe that in few cases there is uh, you know there is some merit, then they will admit them. But in other cases, uh, it is a matter of right of people to go and appeal. Like for example, if you have a dispute with the, uh, you are not happy with the national green tribunals order. So, then you can go to the Supreme Court as a matter of right. Constitutional appeals. The Supreme Court hears appeals from high court judgments, decrees or final orders if the high court certifies that the case involves a substantial question of constitutional interpretation. A party can argue that a constitutional question was wrongly decided. At least five Supreme Court judges must determine such cases, but this requirement is often ignored. For example, the constitutional challenge to the criminalization of sodomy was decided by a two judge bench because they are limited judges, so sometimes they allow only few judges to hear the matter, but ideally there has to be five judges to hear the constitutional matters. The Supreme Court has given little guidance on what constitute a substantial question of constitutional law. They decide this issue by case by case analysis. Civil appeals. So, Supreme Court uh, hears civil appeals from high court judgments, decrees or final orders if the high court certify. Okay. That's fine. Criminal appeals. In its criminal appellate jurisdiction, the Supreme Court has a crucial role in appeals against dead sentences. So, that's dead penalties, you know, if someone is going to be hanged, then they have a special power. Indian court can impose the death penalty for a range of criminal offenses, as you know, from the district court to Supreme Court. 
uh, appeals lie to the Supreme Court from High Court judgments, final orders or sentences that reverse an acquittal, reverse an acquittal on appeal and sentence a defendant to death. So, suppose the district court has some uh, uh, found that someone has not committed a crime. However, when the government appealed in the High Court, the High Court reversed the uh, acquittal. They said, no, this guy is guilty and then they give him death sentence. So, absolute, from absolute freedom to death sentence, it is a big change in someone's life. So, that matter will go to the Supreme Court automatically. Withdrew a case from a subordinate court for trial before itself and convicted and sentenced a defendant to death. Beyond capital cases, capital cases means death penalty cases, the Supreme Court has jurisdiction where a high court certified that a case is a fit for appeal. Okay. Parliament can confirm special powers to deal with this such type of issues. As I talking about the special leave appeals, the Supreme Court has an overriding and extensive jurisdiction on grant special leave to appeal from any judgment, decree, determination, sentence or order in cause of any matter passed or made by court or tribunal, okay, except military courts or tribunals. Despite that special character, these appeal constitute the bulk of the Supreme Court docket. The Supreme Court has developed clear jurisprudence to guide its discretion to grant to refuse ref uh, the bill. The Supreme Court in 2016 held that it was better in the interest of justice to exercise its discretion with circumvention uh, rather than to limit the power of forever. So, uh, see what, what they believe that if people are not getting certificate from the high court, then they must not stop there only. They must get an opportunity at least go to the Supreme Court and try their case. If Supreme Court finds that there is some substance in their case, they will admit otherwise they will appeal it. So, in our country at least everybody can go to Supreme Court once you know uh, as a matter of right or under the special leave appeals. Then advisory jurisdiction. The president can refer a question of law or fact to the Supreme Court if it is a such a nature and such public importance that it is expedient to do so. So, if the, super, if the president of India thinks that there is an issue and the Supreme Court should interpret or give their advisory, then Supreme Court does so. At least five Supreme Court judges must hear a reference. After holding any uh, hearing, it, think, uh, it thinks appropriate the Supreme Court can report its opinion to the president. Opinion must be delivered in open court. It cannot be a confidential uh, thing. A majority of judges present must uh, concur with the opinion, but a judge can uh, dissent also. Transfer petition jurisdiction. The Supreme Court can dispose of cases involving substantially similar legal questions than that are either the Supreme Court or one more or high courts or two or more high courts provided that involve a substantial question of general importance. It can dispose of the cases on its own motion or an appeal by the Attorney General of India or on a party's application. The Supreme Court return a withdrawal case of high court to determine in line with its judgment. Supreme Court can and does transfer cases from one high court to another if it is expedient to do so for the end of justice. So, if they believe that a particular person will not get justice in this particular uh, district court or high court, they can transfer that case to another high court. Okay. This is very normal when there are some high political issues, uh, big scandals where they believe that the government or the bureaucrats will not allow to do a proper fair trial. So, uh, too much political or uh, you know, other types of pressure. In that scenario, Supreme Court may transfer that matter to outside of the courtroom, uh, outside of that particular state. It can also transfer civil proceeding in high court or other civil courts in one state to a high court or a civil court in another state. Criminal cases from one high court to another, cases from criminal court subordinate to one high court to a criminal court or equal or superior jurisdiction subordinate to another high court. So, it is not only the high court, even they can transfer district court cases from one state to another state. Other Supreme Court's power, power of review, the Supreme Court review its own judgments and orders subject to statutes and Supreme Court rules. So, if they believe 
that suppose if someone wants to review their judgment that you know in past you have given this judgment but can you review your judgment they can do it power to do complete justice the supreme court can pass decree or make make necessary order for doing complete justice in matters before it which are enforceable throughout india it has issued those powers widely particularly in the enforcement of fundamental rights supreme court make orders to secure attendance in court discover or produce documents and investigate or punish contempt of itself subject to statutes power of parliament to alter supreme court jurisdictions and power in addition to enlarging the supreme court criminal appellate jurisdiction parliament can confer further jurisdiction and power to the supreme court like matters specified in the union list matters the government of india and state government agrees to confer upon it it had exercised power widely passing statutory providing for appeals to the supreme court while various courts and tribunals okay so this type of like parliament can also help the supreme court to enter into other areas also so now we will talk about high courts of india each state must have a high court india has 28 states and 8 union territories including the national capital territory of india and city parliament can establish a high court for two or more states also or two or more states and the union territory there are currently 25 high courts with all union territories sharing a high court with one or more states except the ncit which has its own high court okay so you need to understand that why we have set up all high courts uh, in every state because within the state when the district judiciary is functioning there has to be someone who can uh, act as appellate tribunal appellate body or some writ jurisdictions or to protect the constitutional rights of the people at the grassroots level at the state level we have set up the high court so they are very powerful uh, organizations and they are also doing the job just like supreme court in the state so you can call them like a supreme court of a particular state okay so they have the same types of power but they are the supreme court in a particular state high court proceedings are generally conducted in english but not necessary with the president's consent state governor can permit hindi or other official state language in high courts except in judgments decrees and orders okay so all orders are written in english but sometime uh, the with the consent of the state governor uh, the the president the governor can allow to use regional languages also so you will find that in many states um, they are allowed to use regional languages however this is an unofficial practice that in most of the high courts in most of the high courts uh, judges prefer to work in english and the reason is very simple because uh, high court judges are being transferred from one high court to another high court so like for example a judge from uh, karnataka high court he if he transfers to patna high court for that judge it will be very difficult to work in hindi or vice versa also if a high court from uh, lucknow high court or ilahabad high court moves to chennai high court then for that uh, person it's difficult to work in the local language regional languages so to avoid that type of situation mostly they work in english however if the judge advocate and both of them are comfortable in the regional language or the local language they can work there is no problem jurisdiction high courts have jurisdiction and power in the number of areas original jurisdiction including writ jurisdiction and enforce constitutional rights appellate jurisdiction transfer jurisdiction to withdraw cases from subordinate courts that involves a substantial question of constitutional interpretation and inherent jurisdiction under the code of criminal procedure additionally high courts also uh, supervise and monitor and control the subordinate or the district courts and tribunals in their territorial jurisdiction just like the supreme court does for the high court and uh, the supreme court does supervise and monitor the all high courts high courts does the same thing for their district courts within the state original jurisdiction 
High courts can issue directions, orders or writs to any person or authority within their territorial jurisdiction including writs of habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, uh, QO warranto. Okay. So, these type these writs are basically for the specific purpose. Like for example, habeas corpus is that if you believe that the government or the police has detained someone illegally. Okay. So, then in that situation you can go to the high court and high court can issue this order habeas corpus that please present that person before my court. Okay. So, this type of uh, uh, orders can be issued by the high court. The enforcement of the fundamental rights that is very important. In any state if you believe that my fundamental rights has been violated by the my state government or by the police or by any agency in the government you can approach to the concerned high court and the high court will take action. As I said earlier you can go to the supreme court also, but most of the time supreme court says that if it is a very state level issue you know there, there are there is no national issue involved then first you go to your state high court and if the state high court fails to give you any re relief or remedy then only you come to supreme court. You can go to the supreme court under private interest litigation if there is a national level issue involved. Okay. If there is only regional issue involved, local issue involved, then it is always uh, advised to go to the local high court. Okay. High court can also exercise extraordinary civil and criminal original jurisdiction at their discretion. Appellate jurisdiction that is very important. High courts can uh, hear certain civil and criminal appeals from lower courts and tribunals. In criminal cases, a person convicted at trial by a session judge or additional session judge or by any other court which impose a sentence for over 7 years imprisonment can appeal to a high court. Okay. In civil cases, a, an appeal generally lies to supreme court from a lower court appellate decision if the case involves a substantial question of law. A question, a, what is substantial question of law? A question of law is substantial if it is of a general public importance or directly or substantially affects the right of the parties and is unsettled or controversial. As we have seen in the Supreme Court transfer jurisdiction, High Court can do the same thing but within that state only. Okay. They cannot, they cannot uh, act at the national level, they can act only at the regional level. So, the high courts can uh, withdraw and determine cases from subordinate courts that involves a substantial question of constitutional interpretation. Inherent jurisdiction, high courts have inherent jurisdictions to give effect to any order under the code of criminal code of criminal procedure to prevent abuse of the process of any court or to otherwise to secure the end of justice. So, now we will talk uh, I think the high courts are like you know you can understand the Supreme Court is working at the central level, they are doing appellate jurisdiction, original jurisdiction, writ jurisdiction, advisory work, uh, but same thing is done by the high courts at the uh, state level. The only difference is that high court judgments are not binding outside of the high court, uh, outside of that particular state. Okay. So, that is little bit different, but within that state every uh, district court is under obligation to follow and uh, to comply with the state high court order. However, unofficially we have a practice in India that if you produce a different high court's order to a different high court, the, the concerned high court may accept that order based on the discretion power. You know, it is not legally binding on, binding on him, but they can take a reference or some guidance from that particular order. It means that the high court's orders also have some legal value okay, outside of the state. Let us talk about the district court. I think this is the court where most of the people are visiting. If you see the number of cases then you can say almost like uh, 94 percent cases are lying in district and session judge in the, at the district level, 5 percent cases are in high court and only 1 percent cases uh, go to supreme court. So, it is very important to understand the district and sub district courts because this is the place where most of the time almost people go for the justice. 
Indian states and union territories are divided into districts. Each district has a district court and may have a sub district courts also. District and sub district courts are divided into civil courts, criminal or sessions courts. Specialized court operate at the district level such as commercial courts, family court, labor court, enforcement directorate court, CBI courts. You know there are so many specialized court at the district level. High courts control and uh, superintend subordinate courts in their territorial jurisdiction. So, they are under the control of the high court. Subordinate civil judiciary has three levels, district judge, additional district judge, civil judge, senior division and civil judge, junior, junior division. So, a person joins a judiciary if he is given the civil work. When I say civil means the cases which are relating to property, money, or anything which is not criminal in nature. Okay. So, they join as a civil judge, junior division, their, their jurisdiction is very, very limited like they can deal with only small issues. Once they are promoted, then they become civil judge, senior division, then they can go for higher issues. And once they become district judge, then, then they can be called additional district judges also in the civil side. Now, if, if I talk about the uh, criminal ju judiciary, session judge uh, then uh, under the session judge additional session judge and assistant session judges judicial class uh, judicial magistrate class 1 and in metropolitan areas metropolitan magistrate mm okay and then chief and additional judicial magistrate okay and finally judicial magistrate class 2 so when someone joins the judiciary from the criminal side and you need to understand that these judges keep transferring from one place to another place. So, sometimes they are working as a civil judge, maybe after 3 years or 2 years they start working as a criminal judge. Okay. So, the, the, the judiciary remains the same, but their jobs keep changing from uh, civil to criminal or uh, vice versa. So, the lowest judge in the criminal side is judicial magistrate class 2. And once they promoted, then they become judicial class, judicial magistrate class 1. And in metropolitan areas like in Delhi, Bombay or in wherever there is a metropolitan court, then they are called metropolitan magistrate MM. Okay? And once they promoted after MM or the judicial class magistrate 1, they become additional judicial magistrate or CG, first they become CGM, ACGM. So, ACGM is additional chief judicial magistrate and CGM is chief judicial magistrate. Okay. So, they are not the additional district judge, but they are the senior most uh, metropolitan magistrate or the judicial magistrates. Okay. So, they do the administrative control of these uh, judicial magistrates and no doubt they are also under the uh, preview of the district judge. So, at the district level there is only one judge uh, which we, we call them district uh, session judge, okay, district and session judge. He is the boss of every judge in that particular district, and under him, civil and criminal. And from the criminal side, there is a one officer called CJM, Chief Judicial Magistrate. In metropolitan areas, we call it CMMM, Chief Metropolitan Magistrate. So he is the boss of all metropolitan magistrate and the other magistrates, okay. But uh, ultimate boss is the uh, district and session judge. So, I think now you are very clear about the district court, high court and supreme court. So, we will talk more about the alternative dispute resolution in India. Indian authorities have established alternative dispute resolutions ADR mechanism to facilitate access to dispute resolutions and relieve pressure on the formal court system. Uh, you always hear that our Indian courts are very slow, judgments are coming very late because they are overcrowded, they are overloaded. So, to solve this issue, the government of India is trying to create an ADR system since last 20-25 years and the system is that can we create an, uh, uh, some system outside of the court, formal court system where parties can sit together and they can solve the problem with the help of mediators, with the help of arbitrators, with the help of Lok Adalat, Gram Nyayale. So, if I make small difference between mediation and arbitration because you will hear this word uh, very often in the ADR, alternative dispute resolution. So, mediation is a more like an informal way of solving issue. 
So in mediation, a trained mediator will, uh, will sit with parties, he will talk with both parties and he will not suggest anything, he will not give any judgment that who is right, who is wrong. He will just try to find a solution with the help of the both parties. So both parties can find their own solutions and once they find the solution, then he will submit a report to the judge and judge will issue the order. Okay. So, this is how uh, we are saving the time of judiciary. The arbitration is more formal because here the people are creating their own court. Like for example, if you have a commercial dispute with someone and in your contract there is a clause of arbitration. Okay. So, in arbitration both parties can appoint sole arbitrator that you know you appoint someone that okay, why do not you judge our case or most of the time you appoint one, your opposite party appoints another one and those two people appoint the third person. So, this is how the three person uh, hears your case through the arbitration and you decide your time, rules, regulations, both parties can decide the timing, place of uh, arbitration, uh, rules of arbitration, duration of arbitration, everything. So, then both parties are paying to those arbitrators and those arbitrators are acting as a formal judge, you know, they are acting like a judge and they hear the parties and finally, they give the judgment. If you are not happy with that judgment, if you believe that there is something corruption or biasness or against the public policy, in some cases that judgment can be challenged in the courtroom. But most of the time what we believe that uh, we people respect ADR judgment because they understand that this judgment is coming from their own court, you know. So, they have created their own court, own rules and regulations. So, this is how we are helping uh, uh, to reduce the uh, litigation in the judiciary. The final one is tribunals. See, they also play in a very, very important role because tribunals are very much specialized in nature. So, tribunals have existed in India since the colonial period, but in 1976 constitutional amendment inserted a new part, okay, that is 11.5a uh, which consisted of two articles on the creation of the tribunals. Article 3, uh, 323a titles administrative tribunals and article 323b titles tribunals for other matters. Formal judges are appointed to tribunal, for instance, the chairman of uh, administrative tribunal must be a current or a formal high court judge. Depending on the tribunal's decision can be appealed to appellate tribunal or to the courts. Okay. So, uh, the idea was uh, behind this uh, tribunal system that why we cannot create a specialized court, you know, very, very different from the uh, normal court and then those tribunals can specialize in only in one domain and solve the issues. Article 323 which established the administrative tribunal, parliament can permit administrative tribunals to adjudicate disputes and complaints about the recruitments and condition of people in public services and post connected with the union, states, local and other authorities in India local or other authorities under the control of the union government or corporation owned or controlled by the union government. So, if the government officers in the state or na as national level, if they have any dispute, any concern with their bosses means the government, if any PSU officers, if they have any dispute with their bosses or with their organizations, then instead of going to a normal court, they can go to the uh, these specialized court. Article uh, 323b, parliament and state legislatures can establish tribunals to adjudicate disputes, complaints or offenses in a range of areas provided they can legislate in those areas. Such laws may among other things establish a hierarchy of tribunals, specify their jurisdictions, power and authority, outline their procedure and exclude the jurisdiction of courts in case adjudicated by tribunals except the Supreme Court special leave petition under article 136 of constitution. The administrative tribunals act authorize the creation of central administrative tribunals and administrative tribunals for states. 
so article 323b says that the government of india can create more and more specialized tribunals like uh, like we will talk about the national green tribunal and uh, national company law appellate tribunal so nclt national company law tribunal okay so there are so many tri these tribunals are acting like a court they can choose their rule of law they can say that okay we will not follow the civil procedure code which is very complicated we will follow simple procedures where businesses or other specialized issues can be solved quickly and in efficient manner so it's more like an another option to create the specialized court so that people don't go to the normal courts for everything okay we want to develop an ecosystem where specialized courts are taking care of special issues for example like i give you one example only national green tribunal parliaments have established tribunals to adjudicate particular types of cases a prominent example is national green tribunal ngt the ngt hears civil civil cases involving a substantial question relating to environmental uh, environment arising out of certain statutes including enforcement of legal rights relating to the environment it can order relief and compensation of victims for pollution and other environmental damages restitution of the damaged property restitution of the environment so ngt can entertain appeals against certain decision by state governments and other authorities so this is a very specialized tribunal national green tribunal it's only in delhi right now and they can open their branches in other states also so this tribunal is only taking care of the environmental related issues okay and mostly those these type of tribunals are headed by retired high court and supreme court judges so they enjoy a lot of uh, authority and power so it's not uh, and they have a lot of experience also because earlier they have worked with high court and supreme court said so they do understand that how legal system works how the administration works and they can solve very specialized problems like for example another uh, not the tribunal but the commission like the uh, national consumer commission okay so in national consumer commission you can go and solve the consumer related issues so instead of going to a civil court you can go to a specialized uh, authority which is dealing with only consumer courts so my dear students what i was trying to explain you in this lecture that first thing you should understand the system you know you should understand how government works what is the role of it. like uh, here we are talking only about judiciary but apart from judiciary you should try to understand the administration system also that uh, what is the uh, you know tehsildar what is the sdm what is the adm what is the dm what is the commissioner and the same thing in police sub inspector inspector dsp additional sp sp you know what is their role in the society uh, under which rule they are governed if you have any concern or any complaint against them to whom you should appeal and go and file your case and in the same thing in judiciary if you understand the Uh, civil judge criminal judge um, 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 judicial magistrate the role of civil and criminal judges specialized courts at the district level and the top level tribunals commissions so my idea is that though it looks like that maybe not necessary for my business directly uh, but if you develop slowly and slowly the understanding of indian legal system okay if you understand little bit that okay how it works who is doing what what are their powers what are their limitations where i can go for appeal you know if you have general understanding of these thing it really helps you in your business because when you have some issues with the court police or administration this general understanding will help you okay because then you can talk to your lawyers and legal team obviously they will help you and guide you but as a business person you should also have basic understanding of indian legal system so with these words i say thank you